Hello, this is Angela R. Sasser of Angelic Shade Studio. I'm here today to talk to you about my latest painting titled The Lady of January. She's the first of a 12-part series of birthstone paintings where I hope to embody each birthstone as a unique, elegant lady accompanied by flowers that represent each month of the year. This series was directly inspired by the Art Nouveau paintings of Alphonse Mucha, who painted this beautiful rendition of ladies representing the precious stones ruby, amethyst, emerald, and topaz. I like to begin most of my paintings with many thumbnail sketches to get a feel for the pose of the character and the layout of the composition. I wanted a Grecian feel to January to reflect her gemstone's connections to the pomegranate. In nature, garnet is often found in clusters which resemble pomegranate seeds. I can't think of pomegranates without thinking of the tale of Persephone, the goddess who was doomed to the underworld by the taste of four pomegranate seeds. At first, I wanted to feature the snowdrops as January's traditional flowers, but this was less common than the carnation, so the snowdrop became a secondary element by the time I reached the finished product. The design of the window also starts out with very rough sketches. I like to sketch very loosely and feel out the shapes of the stems and flowers. I have many books on Celtic knotwork, Art Nouveau style, and design that I flip through for ideas during this phase. For a list of my Art Nouveau resources, check the link artnouveauresources.angelicshades.com. With my pose and composition flushed out, I began gathering reference photos to help me add a sense of realism to the clothing, jewelry, and figure, as well as to refine the design of the lady's wardrobe. This reference gathering also involved hosting a photo session in my living room, where I used myself as a model to make sure I got the anatomy and folds of the drapery correct. I went through several changes of the character's outfit, trying to establish a look which was not too busy, since the rest of the image is so detailed. This image shows how I mapped out the silhouette of the flowers to establish the flow of the composition, and where I needed my central character to shine through. Her relatively simple wardrobe balances the complexity of the flowers with just enough details in key places to keep the viewer's eye moving throughout the piece. But we are not finished yet! Despite having my line art finished, choosing a color scheme presented the most difficult challenge of this painting. If my garnet was too pink, she appeared to look more like a representation of amethyst. If she were too red, she looked like ruby. If there were too many warm colors, she felt too summery, instead of the traditionally wintry month that January is supposed to be. In the end, I decided to go with more deep reds, grays, and pale pinks to pay homage to the blood red of garnet and the wintry paleness of January. With my rough draft complete, I send it off to my favorite art critique groups, as I have throughout the major points of development. I make final adjustments before finally settling in to paint. Finally, after finishing the line art on the computer, I transferred the image to Strathmore Illustration Board. I used graphite paper to trace the image onto the board. You can also do it the cheap way by rubbing the back of your line art's printout with graphite and tracing over your lines with firm, even pressure. Now that the image has been inked and taped to a masonite board to keep the illustration board flat, it's time to paint. Here's a look at my workspace. Number one is a spray bottle of water which I use to mist my watercolors in the palette to keep them moist. I sometimes use it to mist the paper when I need the paper to be wet for wet and wet techniques. Number two is one of the three watercolor palettes visible. I really need to invest in a bigger palette so I won't have them spread out all over my workspace. Number three is a brush cleaning cup that helps me clean my brush bristles when I want to switch colors. The sponge at the bottom is removable. Number four is a jar of water which is usually a leftover spaghetti jar or any kind of sauce jar that you can clean out and use to hold water. This is so you can thoroughly clean your brushes before when you're switching colors while you paint. Number five is my assortment of brushes with a paper towel for dabbing. Number six is my reference sheet, so I have a, my anatomy reference right beside me while I paint, and it also has my color scheme so I can remember what colors I'm working with. Seven is low-tack artist tape, which I use to affix the painting to the masonite board. It is acid-free and won't tear the painting when I remove it from the board. Number eight is the painting, which has been inked with sepia micron pens. These pens contain India ink, which is waterproof, meaning my paint won't smudge the lines. I've also drawn this picture on Strathmore Wet Media Illustration Board, which is smooth enough to allow for clean, crisp ink lines, but has enough tooth in the surface to allow for paint to be absorbed. 
Here's a closer look at my brushes. I use brushes called rounds for most of my work with a flathead brush for filling in larger washes or covering parts of the paper with water. My brushes are fairly small, ranging from triple zero to five in size. Here we have my paints. I've been upgrading my student quality paints to these M. Graham paints slowly over time. The color is bound with honey so that the pigments remain pliable in your palette and dissolve easily in water. Compared to my student paints, these are very rich and don't take as many layers to achieve a brilliant color quality in my pieces. This is important when you have a surface like illustration board that can get saturated after a few layers, limiting how many layers that can be used overall. Another invaluable tool I use while I'm painting is my color cookbook. I use it to sample my colors before using them so I know exactly what their final result will be. I also take note of my favorite color re recipes in this book so I won't forget them later. I also use a spare sheet from this book to test out a stroke of paint. This way I know that I match my colors correctly. Sometimes it's easier to tell if you've mixed the right color when you see them on the paper next to the other colors in your painting. It's better to do this on a scrap sheet of paper rather than putting the wrong color down on your painting and instantly regretting it. I started this painting by using wet and wet techniques to create gray wintry clouds for January in cerulean blue and Bain's gray with a round number four brush. Water is applied to the blank surface first with the pigments laid on top while the paper is still wet. This creates that fuzzy blending effect that's so great for painting clouds. Once the first layer is dry, I create even darker clouds by layering more of the same gray over the previous layers. Layering the same color over a dry layer actually darkens the color, makes it more rich. So if you want to achieve that effect, make sure the layer is dry before you start adding it. You can see I started using a hair dryer to speed up the process. I also used very pale cerulean blue to, to start painting in the window design. For the bodice, I used a watered down mixture of Naples yellow and Payne's gray. I like to paint in a base color for most of the areas of the piece so that when the paper white shows through, it's the brightest part of the piece value-wise. This helps me to really bring focus to the areas I want later on. Here I've started painting the shadows of her veil first because I want the red to be a very rich and deep garnet red. Each excessive layer of paint will make the shadow even deeper and help blend it with the red. I use a mixture of alizarin crimson and sap green for the shadows because blending complementary colors like red and green creates a deeper, less saturated hue of red. For the skin, I like to lay down a layer of accent colors using rose matter and cerulean blue. These accents help breathe life into her skin, which would otherwise look dull and lifeless without the color variation. Because my figure has very pale, fair skin, I've chosen to use ultramarine blue in the shadow, which will help push the pale yellows and pinks of her skin tone, which will be added later. All the while, I have my reference sheet just off camera to help me remember where to paint my cast shadows, which are key to rendering a convincing figure. Now I begin very carefully laying in a watered down mixture of cadmium red and yellow ochre for the midtone of the skin. I keep glazing watered down layers of this mixture until the blue of the shadow blends in with the skin. If I put too much of the mixture down, resulting in a sunburn look, I quickly dab the color off with a paper towel, which is the closest you'll get to an eraser when it comes to watercolors. Blending of the shadows continues with a glaze of dark umber over the blue areas. This helps to deepen the shadows and blend the colors that were applied earlier. Notice I'm not concerned with painting the skin where the veil is. Painting the skin as you would normally is the first step in creating convincing sheer cloth meaning you'll need to plan what cloth is sheer before you begin painting. Here I am still glazing and glazing dark umber until I get the proper depth to my shadows. I apply one more glaze of a Naples yellow and Chinese white mixture to the skin to help smooth out the colors. 
Now here comes a really scary part, where I start layering in the red of the veil with the lizard and crimson. Getting an even layering takes patience, a big brush, and being mindful to paint in a single area while your paints are still wet, so you don't have any streaks. Additional layering of alizarin helps to get rid of the streaking later on. Now you'll see that I've laid in a light glaze of the alizarin over the arm that's beneath the veil. This is the trick to painting sheer cloth. You must have painted the skin to finish beneath the cloth and let it completely dry so you won't smear any of the paint there. Now I'm using a more concentrated mixture of alizarin crimson and dark umber with less water in it to layer over the shadows of the veil in order to blend the previous underpainting and to deepen the shadows. For the sheer cloth, the shadows of the veil are painted normally over the cloth, as if you could not even see the arm at all. This lends to the convincing translucent quality of the material, which tends to obscure what is beneath it where less light shines through, and also where the material is closer to the skin. For her blonde hair, I begin with an underpainting of Naples yellow with raw umber for the shadows. I use burnt sienna to deepen the shadows of her hair even more. The same principle for rendering sheer cloth applies to the hair beneath the sheer veil. Finish shading the hair first, let it completely dry, then paint the veil on top of the hair. It took a few more layers of Elysian Crimson to even out the color of the veil to the richness and consistency that I wanted. Finally, we get to the dress, which consists of a very watered-down glaze of a mixture of Naples yellow, Elysian crimson, and a hint of cerulean blue so that her dress is much less orange than her hair. I wanted the hair and the dress to both be of a cream color without being too similar to one another. The white of the snowdrop on her bodice is actually a very watered down viridian. Again, I want the pure white in this picture to be the highlights where I want to bring the viewer's eye. I'm saving those for last. The stem of her bodice flower began with the kiwi khaki, a tube color from Terry Madden, which was too yellow, so I pushed the tint more towards green by layering sap green on top. The two colors mix together when they layer to form the perfect color that I wanted. I've also added touches of red in her bodice and painted her eyes with a brighter cadmium red to help strengthen her connection to her gemstone, the garnet. I notice at this step that compared to the rest of the piece, the veil still isn't as dark as I want, particularly around the face and hand. I added ever more layers of an alizarin crimson and viridian mix to deepen the shadows and smooth the blending. I also went back at this point and deepened the shadows in her skin. Once the veil became darker, the rest started looking washed out. I needed to bring balance back to the piece by deepening the shadows elsewhere. I used a mixture of Payne's Gray warmed up with Alizarin Crimson and Naples Yellow for the shadows in the dress. I've also added a hint of Alizarin Crimson reflecting in her dress to tie the figure in with her background color. Pale objects also tend to pick up the colors around them, which adds a touch of realism.
Here I'm glazing a mixture of Naples Yellow and Chinese White over the dress to help smooth out some of the streaks and blend the rest of the shadows in with the dress. The bodice, which is meant to be of a slightly reflective material, also gets a tint of alizarin and crimson on the shadow side, as well as a mixture of Payne's Gray and Naples Yellow for the shadows to define the wrinkles. I use the same mixture of shadow gray I used on the main part of the bodice to shade the flower as well. The rest of the silver lining of the veil is treated much the same way as the bodice. The silver bits of her headpiece are also painted with the same mixture I used for the shadows of the bodice. For the snowdrops clasped between her fingers, I began with a shadow layer of a mixture of sap green and a lizard crimson. Once that was dry, I glazed in sap green. I kept my color palette very simple for this piece to keep the painting in tune with the elegant earthy hues of Muha's work. I used the same mixture of sap green and alizarin crimson for the shadows of the carnation stems in her headpiece again keeping my colors consistent across the image to give it a sense of continuity. Venetian red serves as my balancing pink hue so that the picture doesn't become overpowered by the crimson. I also add a glaze of Venetia Red mixed with Naples Yellow to brighten the flowers and make them appear less flat and lifeless. A very subtle texture is added with more concentrated cerulean blue to the back window to help make the shapes in the background more interesting instead of flat. The clouds in the background were still looking too flat, so I decided to add touches of cerulean blue and alizarin crimson to make them more visually interesting, as well as to tie the background in with the color scheme of the main figure. Now with the majority of the piece done, I can finally turn my attention to the carnations in the foreground. I keep them very simple using the same shadowed mid-tone colors I used for the stems and the carnations in the main piece. Again, keeping with the decorative aesthetic of Art Nouveau, the flowers are kept simplistic and defined more by the line art and flat areas of color. The stems that are the furthest back are given the deepest shadow to imply they are farthest from the viewer, whereas the flowers near to the foreground are given barely any definition at all. This three value approach of background flowers, middle ground flowers, and foreground flowers helps to keep the flowers clean and simple so they don't overpower the rest of this piece, which is extremely detailed. I again use Venetian Red as the base color for my carnations, keeping the detailing very simple as I go along. Hatching with a small frying brush allows me to apply the frills that carnation petals have. Mm -hmm. 
Remember earlier that I said I needed to cover all of the paintings so that none of the paper white shines through? Now that the piece is nearly complete, I have a better idea of where I want and need some highlights. I use a white gel pen to pop the jewels in her headpiece and the rims of the flower petals and any other areas that need definition such as the dress. I also use the white gel pen to help bring more definition to the clouds I've been tweaking throughout the entire piece. The final touch to help eliminate the blaring paper white of the background frame is to add a watered down mixture of Naples yellow and alizarin crimson with random table salt thrown in for texture. And now for a touch of shine for that magpie in me. I use the Amico Liquid Silver Leaf to add metallic accents to the window design and the letters, which give this painting a lovely vintage appeal. The final touches include going back over lines that may have been obscured by the paint layers and finishing up any final details. And here we are at the finished piece! I hope you've enjoyed this journey through the painting process of Lady of January as much as I have. If you're interested in learning more of my art techniques, check out my book Angelic Visions, Create Fantasy Art Angels with Watercolor, Ink, and Colored Pencil. This book contains in-depth step-by-step walkthroughs of my process using watercolors, color pencils, and ink. You can find Angelic Visions at your local bookstore or on Amazon or purchase it directly from me for special perks. Be sure to check out my Patreon page dedicated to my art where you can join my journey as I paint this series. Pledging to me allows you sneak peeks of upcoming ladies, exclusive process videos, the ability to pre-order Patreon exclusive items, plus other great rewards. Check out www.patreon.com forward slash Angela Sasser for the full list of rewards. The more pledges I get, the more ambitious I can be with a series and the more rewards that will unlock for everyone. Thanks for watching. Wishing you all inspiration.